All right, all right. Thank you for joining me on this episode of The Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Martin Wilson, and we have another fantastic show for you today. Back to back. I haven't done back to backs in quite some time. If you watched last night debate, you know it was straight up fire. It was awesome. Everything that you look for in the debate, it happened last night. And so we got another one, and we're looking forward to this one of the same capacity, same momentum, same energy. And I have an exciting one for you today. I have today I have Theo and I have Mr. William Arbridge with me. And we're going to be debating is Solo Scriptura biblical? We are going to have so much fun, and I look forward to this one. And I thank you for joining me. Uh, as always, make sure you subscribe to the Gospel Truth and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any shows, debates, interviews, commentaries, anything that the gospel truth has in store right you don't want to miss out anything also all this content in different fashions and forms is on other social media platforms facebook twitter or x instagram and tiktok as well so make sure you flow over there and give support the ministry to subscribe and follow on those platforms also content is on podcast itunes google play and stitcher so make sure you flow on over there as well to support the ministry with a follow subscribe for your audio listening pleasure all right and that said i always have some good shows that are coming up here in the future that i want you guys to be aware of coming up after this debate i have a two-on-two -two. it's gonna be more of an open discussion concerning calvinism should be fun one guys i hope you guys are looking forward to this one as i am as well after that dr michael burgold versus john david barton the son existed with the father and so this is going to be the debate pr premise and look forward to this one hopefully that you are as well after that i have Father Jonathan Evanoff versus Brandon Nero, oneness versus Trinitarian. Jesus is the father. That is the premise of that debate. So hopefully you guys are looking forward to that one as well. And after that, I have that Dr. Sean Cole versus Andrew Griffin. Jesus is God and is Jesus God in the New Testament. That is the premise for that debate. So hopefully you guys are looking forward to it. And also, as always, we have media equipment fundraising that's going down. If you want to support the ministry, there's a fundraising link in the description of this video. Make sure you click that link and get it in if god puts it on your heart all right with that said i am done with the announcements and we as you can tell i am flying by these announcements trying to go as fast as i can because we want to get right into this debate so i'm not going to waste any time let me bring these guys in so they can introduce themselves to you what's up fellas how y'all doing what's going on good good doing great brother how you been hope you all are doing well we're doing well, doing well, and I'm doing even better since I have you two on. We are going to have an exciting discussion, exciting debate. Uh, Solo support, Scriptura. Today is what many will celebrate as Reformation Day. And obviously, this is one of the five solas. And so, uh, this is definitely a pillar of that. And so, this is awesome debate to have on this particular day right this is going to be a fun topic fun debate and so let's not waste any more time before we get into it i do want to allow you guys to introduce yourselves tell them what you do youtube blogs books whatever it is man let them introduce they can come check you out start with william go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself will uh people can find me over at patristic pillars uh people can find my work at earlychurchfathers.com I uh, do a lot of work with Pints of Aquinas, EWTN, Virgin Most Powerful Radio, uh, and I write a lot and I debate a lot. Um, other than that, uh, I don't really like to talk a lot about myself because uh, all glory to God and hopefully uh, all glory will go to God today and to the truth today. And uh, I recognize that it is an important day for a lot of my Protestant friends out there. It is indeed an important day for me. As a Catholic as well. So I look very much forward to dialoguing with a brother today and to, to being here yet again with uh, Marlon uh, as a moderator yet again. All right. All right. Thank you, Will. Appreciate you, man. And so we're going to run it over to Mr. Theo. What you got, Theo? What you got, man? Tell him what you do. Hey, what's going on, guys? Very glad to be here with uh, these two gentlemen. Um, I run a YouTube page, Theosophical Wanderings. Um, I am by no means anywhere near uh, to what William does as far as uh, debate experience. He is definitely the more experienced debater. I don't really blog. Uh, I just have this little YouTube channel and I interact on Facebook. And I'm sort of new to the whole uh, Catholic, Protestant, Eastern Orthodox uh, debate. Um, so um, I definitely probably won't be as... Uh, you know, well versed as William, but I'm going to do my best here and um, just kind of stand by my convictions. But uh, very excited for today. And uh, this was not planned for uh, August or October 31st. I just kind of ended up happening that way. So that's kind of cool. Things landed on this date. So looking forward. <clears throat> 
all right all right cool guys yeah definitely was a plan man i guess uh i know none of y'all calvinists but i am i guess god determined it it predestined this to happen <laughs> according to his divine decree <laughs> hey hey we both we all believe in god's or god can ordain things on all of our views so all right all right cool cool yeah, cool yeah, good we're good all, stuff, i'm good sure william, believe, william agrees with that so <laughs> oh yeah just not, just just not on board with calvinism at all <laughs> it's all good. Love it's you though, Marlon. I, I, love, I love you though, Marlon. I love you, brother. <laughs> I love you guys too, man. I love you guys too. All right. So let's get into it, man. All right, the topic of today's, today's debate is the Sola Scriptura Biblical. Uh, deal, you're arguing the affirmative. William, you're arguing the negative. So we're going to start with 15 minute opening statements. We're going to follow that with five minute uh, rebuttals. Then we're going to have a 40 minute cross sex, 20 minutes each to cross examine each other. And then we're going to close out with five minute closings. And then if we have time, guys out there in the audience, we don't know if we're going to get a QA in. But if time permits, we will have about a 20, 30 minute QA. But we'll see how that goes. But thus, as of right now, we do not have a Q&A in store. So that said, we're going to jump right into it. Theo, you are going to be the affirmative. So I'm going to get you prepped up and ready. And then I will get the time up. If you remember this little chime, it will be a one minute indication saying, hey, you might, have start, might want to start wrapping up your presentation. And the time will be in your upper left hand corner of the main screen. So if you want to reference that time, it'd be up there. So that said, uh, Theo, you got it for 15 minutes and I'll start your time as soon as you begin to speak. Okay, let's go. We good? We are good to go. All right. Thank you, Marlon and William, for hosting this debate. Uh, so let's get right into it. Um, how many times have you heard the claim sola scriptura is not in the Bible? Protestants are in a dilemma. I've heard this plenty of times and I'm sure you have too. And I'm here today to challenge this often repeated claim the topic for the debate today is whether sola scriptura is biblical. I take the affirmative, William takes the negative. So let me make my case for why I think sola scriptura is biblical. First, some housekeeping. When I say that sola scriptura is biblical, let me explain what I do not mean. I do not mean that there is an explicit passage that says sola scriptura. Nor do I mean that sola scriptura has been the norm at every point throughout history. So let me tell you what I do mean. First, some definitions. By sola scriptura, I mean that the scriptures are the sole final authority in the church. In other words, the scriptures are the thing everything else is measured against, but are not themselves measured by anything else. They are the final authority. And they are the sole authority in the sense that there is no other authority in the church given by God that is final like the scriptures are. So what do I mean by biblical? I mean when something is either explicitly contained within the Bible or can be rightly inferred from the Bible. Notice, I gave two options here for how something can be biblical. It can either be explicit or it can be inferred. So when I say that sola scriptura is biblical, I am taking the second option. I am saying that it can be rightly inferred from the biblical data. Now, someone might object to this move and assert that the only way sola scriptura can be biblical is if I can find an explicit verse that mentions it. But this is false. We infer lots of things from the Bible that are not explicit. The Trinity being the prime example. Nowhere does the word Trinity appear explicitly in the Bible, yet we still think that the Trinity is biblical. This is because we do not need an explicit passage that says Trinity. We can infer the Trinity from the preponderance of the biblical data because we see all the members of the Trinity in Scripture. So we do not need for something to be explicit in the Bible in order to say that it is biblical. We can infer it. So I think that sola scriptura is biblical. I have two main arguments in which I will make my case. The first being what I call the bird's eye view of scripture. This refers to what we see in scripture as a whole from beginning to end. Notice that my definition of sola scriptura is that the scriptures are the sole final authority in the church. Okay, so why should we think this is biblical? Well, from a bird's eye view, all throughout the Bible, we see repeated over and over this idea that what God says has final authority. Let me repeat that. All throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we see this idea that what God says has the final authority. We also see in the Bible that the scriptures are what God says to the church. So we have these two facts that we see in the Bible, and this is where we make our inference. So if nothing else we possess today contains what God says to the church besides the scriptures, then we can infer that the scriptures are the sole final authority for the church today. Simply put, the word of God has always had the final authority and if the scriptures are the only thing we have today that contains the word of God, then that's our final authority. Here's all this laid out in a syllogism. One, 
From the scriptures, we see that what God says to the church has final authority. Two, the scriptures are what God says to the church. Three, if what God says to the church has final authority and the scriptures are what God says to the church, then provided that nothing else we possess today contains what God says to the church besides the scriptures, then the scriptures are the sole final authority in the church. Four, nothing else we possess today contains what God says to the church besides the scriptures. Five, therefore the scriptures are the sole final authority in the church. So I think William and I will be in agreement with the first three premises. I think where he will disagree is with premise four. Nothing else we possess today contains what God says to the church besides the scriptures. So how do I defend this premise? Well, there are two steps to this and both are abductive. The first step is to argue that God does not speak to the church today. And by this, I mean in the sense that God does not give the church new public revelation. As most Christians agree, God spoke through the apostles and the apostolic period was the final period that God gave divine public revelation. And this period ceased after the death of the last apostle. Thus, God is no longer speaking to the church via public revelation. And we have biblical evidence to back this up. Hebrews 1.1 says, in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. Notice the past tense here of has spoken, which makes sense because Christ was the consummate fulfillment of everything foreshadowed in the Old Testament and was ultimately what it all pointed to. Therefore, his fulfillment was final and sufficient. And then we also have Jude 1.3, which refers to the faith once for all delivered. Notice it says once for all delivered, not continually being delivered. So God speaking to the church through public divine revelation is confined to the apostolic period, and that period is now over. So I think that the only thing we possess today that contains what God says to the church are the scriptures. This is where the second step of my argument comes in. Remember, God last spoke to us through the apostles, but it has been 2,000 years since the apostles were alive. Not a lot survives in that amount of time. Sure, when they were alive, the apostles gave inspired oral teachings and inspired written teachings, the latter of which we find in the scriptures. But between their oral and written teachings, I would argue that it's more likely that the only thing we have left today are their written teachings, because there's just no reliable way we could preserve, much less know what their oral teachings are after 2,000 years. That would be very unlikely. So these are my two steps to support premise four. In summary, these two steps make a good abductive case that nothing we possess today contains what God says to the church besides the scriptures. If my opponent disagrees with this, then he bears the burden of proving that he has an actual inspired apostolic tradition not found in scripture. And if he cannot do this, then we have no reason to believe that anything besides the scriptures contain what God says to the church, and thus my argument goes through. Now, I want to briefly point you to something I just mentioned here. Notice, I said that both the oral and the written teaching of the apostles were inspired. I'm pointing this out to preempt my opponent in raising an issue between the oral teaching of the apostles and sola scriptura. But there is simply no issue between these two because the oral and written teaching of the apostles make up the same body of revelation. Plus, as I've argued, it's more likely than not that the inspired oral teaching of the apostles eventually found its way into the written teaching of scripture, at least as far as what remains today. Thus, there is no issue here for Sola Scriptura. Now let's move on to the second part of my argument to show that Sola Scriptura is biblical. This is what I call my zoom lens view, because it focuses in on a specific biblical passage that makes better sense if Sola Scriptura were true. And that passage is Mark 7, 13, in which Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for their traditions, saying, thus you nullify the word of God by your traditions that you handed down. Here we see a principle from Jesus that is as follows. God's word should never be nullified by human interpretive tradition. Nobody, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, or Protestant would reject this principle. All of us would affirm that God's word should not be nullified by human tradition. So we have to ask, which hypothesis best predicts such a principle? Is it the sola scriptura hypothesis or is it some sort of infallible church hypothesis like Catholics and Eastern Orthodox hold? Let's look at the facts here. Biblically, we can show that Jesus believed in a seat or cathedra of Moses. We can also show that Jesus thought that the Pharisees sat in that seat. We can show that Moses himself was appointed to his office directly by God, which included this seat. We can show that this seat commanded obedience. And we can show that the tradition that Jesus was referring to here was an oral interpretive tradition held to be infallible by those who sat in this seat. And finally, we know that this oral tradition was believed to have been given to Moses 
at the same time as the law. It was supposed to be part of the original Mosaic deposit. And yet, we can also show that Jesus believed that God's word should never be nullified, not even by the interpretive authority that God ordained to sit in this seat. Notice here all the similarities between the claims of the Pharisees and Roman Catholics. Both claim to sit in a cathedra. Both claim their tradition goes back to the beginning. Both claim their traditions are infallible. But notice that Jesus never once appeals to any infallible Jewish tradition as the final authority. He only appeals to scripture. This implies that unless one can establish a clear and relevant difference between the Pharisees' oral tradition and the Catholic Eastern Orthodox oral tradition, it is highly likely that Jesus would hold scripture above any such tradition when they conflict. Let me repeat that. If there ever is a conflict between scripture and tradition, scripture always wins out. This implies that there is a hierarchy where scripture sits above the interpretive tradition, which is exactly what my definition of sola scriptura entails, and this is exactly what you see in Mark 7. Mark 7 also shows that, in principle, there is a possibility that the two could nullify one another. So we would need a clear reason to think that any such possibility would, would be ruled out today. So out of all the Christian authority structures on offer, sola scriptura seems to be better expected on Mark 7. It shows that if an interpretive tradition conflicts with scripture, then it is tradition that must submit to scripture and not the other way around, which is exactly what you would expect on sola scriptura. This explanation is far less ad hoc than rivals, has greater explanatory power and scope, and it coheres better with rational background assumptions about human nature and the authority of God's words. Therefore, given Mark 7, sola scriptura is the more biblical hypothesis. For convenience, here is all of this laid out in a syllogism. One, Jesus' words in Mark 7 are best explained by one of the following hypotheses about church authority, sola scriptura or an infallible church. Two, Jesus' words in Mark 7 are not best explained on an infallible church hypothesis. Three, therefore, Jesus' words in Mark 7 are best explained by sola scriptura. Four, therefore, sola scriptura. Now, William and others might say, yes, we can agree with this Mark 7 principle. But this principle only applies to human interpretive tradition. But our, interpret our interpretive tradition is not human. It is infallible and guaranteed to be true by God. But in response to this, I would simply argue that this is very unlikely on several grounds. One, are we to expect that Jesus would promise us a church like that? A church that is infallible and is therefore incapable of being wrong in its teachings? Consider, the church itself is founded entirely on Jesus' teaching and that's what its mission is centered around. But think of what the idea of infallibility means. It means that the church's teaching cannot possibly be wrong. And if the church's teaching cannot possibly be wrong, this means that its teaching is beyond the reach of correction, challenge, or testing by anything else, including by Jesus's very own words. So how likely is it that Jesus would promise a church that is founded on his words, but then is totally immune to being corrected by his words? It seems very unlikely on its face. More directly, Jesus never promises such a church. Two, there is an argument to be made that an infallible interpretation is just new revelation, which conflicts with the biblical data that revelation has ceased. Here's why. Infallibility only comes from God, and the church itself cannot speak infallibly apart from God. So if the church infallibly declares an interpretation, then by necessity it is God who is declaring it through the church and not the church itself since again, only God is infallible. And if God is infallibly declaring things to the church, then God is still speaking. And if God is still speaking, then revelation has not ceased. But since this conflicts with the biblical data, as well as official Roman Catholic teaching, we would not expect a church like this. Three, the application of Mark 7 itself. Almost all of us believe that scripture still has application for us today beyond just its immediate context. So what would the application of Mark 7 be today? The lesson in Mark 7 is about which has the final authority, ecclesial authority or the word of God. If the ecclesial authority for today is simply presumed infallible and unable to be corrected by the word of God, then I'm afraid that Mark 7 really has no application for the church today. But this seems very unlikely. And finally, four, there is, there is an abundance of biblical evidence that no one simply has a presumption of infallibility, not even prophets or apostles. In Deuteronomy 18, you see that the office of prophet had to be tested against Scripture. And then in Galatians 1.8, Paul says that 
even if an apostle or an angel from heaven teaches you another gospel, then let them be anathema. Thus, Paul suggests that even their message needs to be subject to the word of God. Thus, everything is to be tested against and subjected to the word of God. There is no presumption of infallibility given to humans. So why should we think that the church has this presumption more than an apostle does? So seeing how this presumption is denied in both the Old and New Testaments, and that all are to be subject to scripture, it seems very unlikely that this would not be in effect today. And this is what we'd expect on the sola scriptura hypothesis. So in summary, I think I've provided two very strong arguments for thinking that sola scriptura is biblical. Moving forward, I want the audience to pay special attention to what my opponent must show in order to refute my argument. He may say all kinds of things about the canon or who gets to interpret or these other things, but that is not the topic of the debate today. The topic of debate is whether sola scriptura is biblical. So in order to directly refute my argument, he has to address exactly what my argument says. He has to show that what we ha he has something today other than the scriptures that contain what God says to the church and that sola scriptura is not the best explanation for the data um, of Mark 7. So unless and until he does, and my argument goes through. Happy Reformation Day. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Theo, for that opening statement. Appreciate you. All right, William, you are now in the seat and you are ready to go for your 15 minute opening. And let me I will... get that open. All right. Hold on, let me get my timer up. Great. Okay. What? And I guess to begin as soon as I begin. Yep. I'll start the time as soon as you start. All right. Here we go. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Happy Halloween. Today, our goal is not particularly to present a comprehensive case against the doctrine of sola scriptura, the man-made doctrine, which asserts that the Bible alone is the sole and ultimate authority in matters of faith and morals, matters of faith and practice. The burden of proof, and you're going to notice, I'm not going to be responding to the opening statement of my brother here at all. That wouldn't be fair. That will be done in the rebuttal period. So if there's any overlap, it's because I've already prepared it, but there's a lot that I'm not going to be responding to until my rebuttal, probably 99% of it. So today, the burden of proof for those that hold the solar scriptura is squarely on my brother's shoulders. And I am not only skeptical that he can fulfill that burden, I know for a fact that he is not going to. The standard of sola scriptura has never been a part of the ancient apostolic faith. It is a theological novelty, a novum, that Calvin, Zwingli, Luther, all of the reformers held to differently than my brother here. They didn't even hold to it in the same way. They didn't even hold the scriptura in the same way. You're going to find that there is a massive amount of divergence. So today I'm going to show you what do I need to do today? Do I need to show you all today? that the Catholic Church is infallible, or to talk about any kind of traditions outside of the Bible? Not at all. I simply need to demonstrate how the Bible, the Old and the New Testament, and I am going to supplement church fathers as commentaries. Of course, I know this debate is about Scripture alone being biblical, but I use them as commentaries. I know the brother doesn't believe they are authoritative. I do. But I'm going to use, utilize them as commentaries to show that None support the notion of exclusive reliance in Scripture as the sole authority in Christian doctrine and practice. In the Old Testament, there is no concept of sola scriptura, and this belief in Scripture alone faces significant hurdles. The Old Testament is without a doubt a part of the foundation life of the Christians, myself and the brother. There's nowhere that you can find any idea of sola scriptura. And I know some people have attempted to show that to be the case. It's nowhere there. Deuteronomy 7, 17, 8 to 13, the passage, God commands that difficult cases and controversies be brought before priests and judges. Their decisions were to be obeyed, emphasizing the importance of religious authority beyond the written law. Malachi 2, 7, the prophet Malachi describes the role of the priest as a messenger of the Lord, highlighting the importance of human authority in teaching and in interpreting God's will. Nehemiah 8. When Ezra the scribe read the law to the people, he was assisted by other leaders who helped the people to understand the law. The Old Testament, of course, would not be our battleground, if you will, to show the false doctrine of sola scriptura, to show that the doctrine of sola scriptura is false. But we can show you that this principle um, is nowhere to be found, neither in the Old or in the New Testament. 
In the New Testament, the case against Scripture alone becomes even stronger. There's not a single passage, and I know the brother likely is not going to argue for one single passage. I know that even the Reformers didn't do that. But they argued for a kind of overall case cobbled together from all other kinds of passages. And I can tell you right now, there's nothing there, nothing at all. Uh, rather, we find the opposite. The New Testament contains passages that highlight the importance of sacred tradition and the church as an authoritative institution. Now, today we're not debating the infallibility of the church, but we're showing that sacred tradition, if there is something else that is viewed as having the authority as God's word, then the idea of scripture alone being the only thing where God's word is preserved, really, it falls apart. 2 Thessalonians 2.15, the apostle Paul is very clear. He says, so then, brothers, stand firm, hold to the traditions you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. This clearly affirms the incredible value of both the oral and the written scripture. And I know the argument my opponent and other Protestants will make. They'll say, well, you know, it's talking about the gospel, only the gospel. No, it's not. No, it isn't. And I can show that to the overwhelming, exclusive, uh, uh, overwhelming, unanimous testimony of the patristic interpretation of this. So the burden of proof is to show that this is referring to traditions that are all found within scripture alone. It's not. You're to hold to the oral and the written. They are both the word of God, not only the written. My, my friend today is going to have quite, quite the journey up that hill, up that hill to show that Scripture alone is the normative standard. If no, we're in the Scripture itself. Is there anything even remotely, remotely there for this? Matthew 18, 15 to 18. Here Christ outlines a process for resolving disputes within the church, indicating the church's authority in matters of discipline and doctrine. That's very important that I want to emphasize over and over and over. Whenever we look, we find that Scripture alone is not, is not the only authority. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, we read verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Now, pay attention. The word of God, which you heard from us. Now, what do we mean by Tradition. Now, we can we call it sacred tradition. Why do we call it sacred tradition? Because if the Lord tells us then what you're going to hand down is going to be protected by the Holy Spirit, you can better believe it is sacred. The, the very word tradition comes from the Greek word paradosis, paradosis, which is what is handed down. We don't believe that only the word of God is confined to Scripture alone because, well, guess what? The Scripture alone doesn't say that. Now, if there was a hint of that in the Scripture alone, well, you know, maybe we would have something there. Even in the, pa the, the popular battleground passage of 2 Timothy 3, even in that particular passage, we have traditions that are mentioned early on in that passage. We have traditions that are mentioned in Acts 17. You want to be a noble Berean? Do you want to be a noble Berean? What do the noble Bereans do? They search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. What a noble Berean. Sticking to Sola Scriptura, right? But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, so it is preached, it is oral, and it is written down. I suggest all of us be like the noble Bereans today and realize that the word of God is within the Scriptura, within the Scripture, and also orally taught, handed down. Yes, there are apostolic teachings that were handed down. Not all of them are found in the scriptura. And we got a massive problem today. If my friend, I don't want to call him opponent. I, I can't stand that. He's, he's, he's a brother. We've been in communication. Uh, I, I consider him a brother. I consider him a good guy. So excuse me if I ever say opponent. I mean to say brother. Uh, my brother, uh, despite being my brother, has quite the hill to climb today. Uh, and I'm not going to lend him any climbing gear at all. Uh, the problem being is you very clearly find that the normative paradigm in scripture is not scripture alone, because if you stick to scripture alone, you got a big problem. How do you even determine what the scriptura is? Now, I know that Protestants realize that the Achilles heel of Protestantism is the canon. There's no way at all that you're gonna be able to come to a consensus on what the canon is. 
I saw a number of videos that my, my brother put out, particularly telling people it's okay. No need for worry. We got Michael Kruger and the Michael Kruger theory. There, there's really no problem. Uh, whatever is scriptura, you know, it, it, it holds on to the model of apostolicity. Still doesn't help you discover or come to the conclusion of how you determine what is your standard. If that is your standard, how do you determine it? You need tradition. There's no way around it. Not even if you put on the greatest of tinfoil hats in the world, are you going to receive revelation to tell you all of these books are what comprise Holy Scriptura. You got a big problem there. And I might just say Bible alone from now on so that I don't have to keep saying Sola Scriptura over and over. This has never been the standard ever. I remember how I told you all that I would talk a little bit of the early church. This was never the standard ever. Some Protestants like to say, well, in the beginning it wasn't, and later on it became the, uh, the normative standard. I've heard uh, uh, theologians like, uh, like Dr. White say that, and I am not comparing uh, my brother to Dr. White. I'm just saying a lot of people say that. William Webster, White, Swan, uh, my friend, and dear, dear friend, Turretin fan. I, and I don't agree. I don't think that ever becomes the normative standard. It wasn't in the apostolic era where Ignatius of Antioch orders those to stick to the bishop where Irenaeus urges those to stick to tradition. Not tradition alone, but Bible and tradition. <clears throat> we don't have any, any of the apostolic churches holding to the idea of Scripture alone. Remember, there was a time when we were all united, my Oriental Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Catholic. Which one of these apostolic churches does the Assyrian Church of the East hold to Scripture alone? Oriental Orthodox, Eastern, Catholic, none of them do. None of them. Dr. Brock, who is a near and dear friend of mine, says, he told me personally as I reached out to him, he said, Sola Scriptura is not apostolic. None of the apostolic churches have a clue as to what that is. That is a modern day invention. Now, by modern day, of course, he means at the time of the Reformation. Scholar and theologian, Father John McGuckin, an expert on the early Eastern Christian tradition, reflecting on the Oriental Orthodox and Eastern tradition, says, the early Christian community understood faith to be a dynamic reality lived out within the community's liturgical life. Protestants don't know what liturgos is. They don't know about the liturgical life of the church. If they did know about it, they wouldn't be spouting this teaching of Scripture alone, of Bible alone. Indeed, they don't know about the liturgical life of the church because that was the life of the church. You'd go to Mass. Yes, it was Mass. I hate to break it to you, Protestant friends. It was Mass wherever you went in the world. Even during the time of Luther, Luther held to that belief. And the Bible was never intended to function as a standalone authority. It is a living faith of the community that provides the context for interpreting the scripture, the tradition, Father John McGuckin says. Eastern Orthodox Church, with its rich theological heritage, has consistently rejected scripture alone. You just have to look at Yassi and the confession of the Scythius to find that to be a reality. But Orthodox theologian Father Alexander Sherman says, in Orthodoxy, tradition is not the past. It is the whole life of the church, that life in which the Holy Spirit dwells and through which he acts. Tradition is a church. And of course, I am a Roman Catholic. I am a Catholic. And the Catholic scholarly perspective can be summed up in the great Cardinal Avery Dulles, a prominent Catholic theologian who says, he once remarked, the authority of the church cannot be derived from the Bible alone. The church is not a mere product of the word. Rather, it is a living community that produces the word, discerns it, and bears witness to it. None, none of the apostolic churches had a clue to what this novelty was. None of them. Augustine would be turning over in his grave as St. Augustine argued and debated against the heretic Maximian. Maximian, what was Maximian arguing? It's like, hey, man, show me the Holy Trinity from the Bible alone. We're not going to hold to that Nicene Creed, that tradition of yours. Get me the doctrine of the Trinity from the Bible alone. Interestingly enough, the very first time 2 Timothy is utilized, is utilized in favor of Sola Scriptura, it's utilized by an Arian to argue against the doctrine of the Trinity. Doesn't surprise me at all. Because when you look at the life of the early church, council after council, we're talking about real meat and potato stuff. We're not talking about uh, playground child's play stuff. We're talking about the Council of Nicaea, Second Constantinople, Ephesus, Nicaea, where over and over the formulations reflect the biblical language of the Apostles' Creed and embody apostolic tradition. Remember, what was it? 
that the great St. Athanasius, St. Augustine, and everybody stood for and fought the Bible and sacred tradition. They were being attacked by the Bible, from the Bible, by the heretics. And they were saying, what are you talking about? The great Ignatius, those great fathers of all, the great tradition of the church has never held to Scripture alone. You find those testimonies at Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, Second Nicaea, and on. When East and West were united. My point today is not to make this a debate about early church fathers. I utilize them to show that the lived life of the early church looks nothing, nothing like modern day Protestants, Protestantism puts forth. And I want to be careful when I say modern day Protestantism. I don't think modern day evangelicals resemble anything of Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Arminius, or any of those, or Turretin. I don't. A lot of them held to different doctrines that eventually would be shed later on in history. So, well, whose version of Sola Scriptura is the correct one? The first reformers or the modern day ones? What's going on? Are the modern day reformers, are they receiving new revelation to where the doctrines that their forefathers, their forebears held to are no longer there? They're gone? Now, with the final 25 seconds that I have, I can tell you that there are a number of passages that tell you that the word of God is passed down orally and written. In order for Bible alone to work, you'd have to override that or show that they are the exact same thing. We haven't gotten to cross-examination, but I can guarantee you that my brother will not be able to show that they are the exact same thing every single time. Well, I got one second, I'll surrender that. All right, thank you, William, for the William and uh, Theo for the opening statements. We are now transitioning to our rebuttal round. And Theo, you're back in the seat for your five minute rebuttal. And I will start your time as soon as you begin to speak. Okay, thank you for that uh, spirited opening there, William. Um, so my brother, I don't want to call him an opponent either. He, he said that I, uh, I there's a climb that I got to make and I have not, I have not made that. I, I have made the climb. I've, I've made an inference. Uh, and the only way he can deny that I've made that climb is to deny one of my premises here. Um, he, he talked an awful lot about the early church fathers. This is not something you find in the early church. This is not something you find in the Old Testament, this idea of sola scriptura. That's fine. But what you do find is that we are to obey what God says. Revelation alone is what we are supposed to obey. That is something you find all throughout scripture, all throughout true, uh, church history. Everyone is trying to obey God. The scriptures are the word of God. And if there's nothing else that we possess today besides the scriptures, then by default, this is this is kind of what we have to center our, our, our church life around, are the scriptures. So I think we're missing the point about uh, this written oral distinction. The point is, is that there's never a time where we did not try to obey God and obey the word of God. And this is where my inference comes in. If there's nothing else today that we have that contains the word of God besides the scriptures, then the scriptures are the sole final authority. So my opponent must show something else that we possess today that contains the word of God not found in the scriptures. Um, I'm not denying ecclesial authority. I'm not denying interpretive authority. I'm not denying the role of the church here. Sola Scriptura is not a denial of any of that. Um, my uh, William mentions um, uh, tradition, and, and I have to ask, well, whose tradition? Uh, the Eastern Orthodox? Uh, Roman Catholics, they both conflict with each other. Um, you also have the Pharisees making uh, similar claims about their traditions, but they were wrong. At the end of the day, all of these claims of tradition have to be measured by something. Otherwise, we have all these conflicting uh, claims out there, like what we see between the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics. So who, who gets to say who's right here? If all we do is appeal to each other's authority, then we're kind of, we're, we're stuck in a conundrum. This is why there, in theory, there needs to be something above that. And I believe that that is the word of God. That's, that's kind of what, uh, that's what stands above those things. Um, he mentions Second uh, Thessalonians, um, but in my opener, I know he's not responding to that. You hear, you, you, you see that I, I, I acknowledge that the apostles had oral teaching and written teaching. They're the same thing. Uh, so when Paul is talking about uh, keeping the, uh, the traditions that he's handed on, uh, whether oral or written, he is not talking about things that came later. He's talking about the apostolic teaching that he gave. He is not talking about like the Assumption of Mary 
or the Immaculate Conception or, or even the papacy, I would argue. So we cannot take this verse uh, out of its context and say it applies to anything any church teaches at any time because the Apostle Paul was referencing oral tradition. Therefore, we can take that and apply it to our oral tradition and say that it is on par with uh, uh, the word of God. That that is That does not follow at all. And uh, so that's an issue there. Um, and I would also say that not everything handed down is apostolic. Uh, even the Catechism of the Catholic Church makes a distinction between um, the ecclesial tradition that comes after the apostles and sacred tradition, the apostolic deposit. Those are two different things, and they aren't. Uh, they 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 make a distinction there. They're not. They're not equal. Um, and I also would say that there's something implicit here that William is getting at where he mentions that uh, he's basically placing sacred tradition on par with the word of God. This is, you know, you have scripture as the word of God, but then sacred tradition is the word of God. So what I would say is if if the sacred tradition of the Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church is on par with the word of God, then revelation has not ceased. Revelation is ongoing, which entails a contradiction between what the Catholic Church claims and also what the biblical data shows that revelation has ceased it is confined to a period it's confined to it's confined to a time of uh the ushering in of a new covenant and so this would be a contradiction against uh the catholic church and i will concede my time all right thank you for so much Theo, for that rebuttal and now william you're back in the seat for your five minute rebuttal and once again i'll start your time as soon as you begin to speak all right give me one moment i didn't think that he was gonna and that early, so I didn't have my timer ready. Here I go. Uh, I apologize for this. All right, here we go. We're told in uh, my uh, brother's opening that we don't need an explicit passage. Uh, how about an implicit one? How about anything? Uh, there's nothing, nothing there. Uh, we're told it has been the norm all throughout history. When did it become the explicit norm? We're then made uh, then a comment that I was shocked at hearing, blown away that the Trinity is not explicit. I'm shocked, the Trinity is explicit. I can show you the Holy Spirit is eternal God, the Son is eternal God, the Father is eternal God, but Bible alone is nowhere on the pages of scripture. I'll tell you right now, audience, the Trinity is as explicit as it can be. What God says has the final authority, he said, we agree, but it doesn't confine this to the Bible alone. We read this already in my opening. We agree in a lot, the brother is right. Uh, he said that nothing else we possess today possesses what God says to the church, but the scripture. Prove it to us. We're told, we, we, look, I, I want to be fair to the brother. He had a 15-minute opening. How many passages did you count that he utilized for scripture alone? Big fat Halloween donut, zero. He utilized Hebrews 1, that, the, that uh, in the last days he's spoken to us through his son. Jude 1, 3, the faith once for all delivered. Where's scripture alone? We agree with all those. Uh, we were asked, where is an apostolic tradition not found in scripture, the canon? You're not going to find that anywhere in scripture. That's an apostolic tradition. Nowhere in scripture. We're told that oral and written teaching make up the same thing. Well, you had 15 minutes of your opening to prove that. You proved nothing. Mark 7 and Mark 15 nullify the word of God. They don't teach to hold to Bible alone or scripture alone. Indeed, if you look at the commentary of the great St. Irenaeus, on Mark 7 and Matthew 15, he says, the Pharisees claimed the tradition of the elders safeguarded the law, but in fact it contravened the law Moses had given. By saying your merchants mix water with wine, Isaiah shows the elders mixed, mixed their watery tradition with God's commandments. Nothing here about Bible alone, but rather watery traditions of men with God's strict commandment. The word of the Lord is what we hear of. We're told directly here by many fathers and in scripture. This incredibly and popular oft quoted passage is not about sacred scripture, scripture contra sacred tradition, but about bad traditions making no what holy God etched in the tablets and handed to Moses on Mount Sinai. Let's be very clear there, clear about this. Today is not about a debate about the infallibility of the church. If the brother wants to argue this, we can do that. But it's not about that. It's about scripture alone. He had 15 minutes to try and prove sola scriptura. We didn't get even one passage. We didn't even get to, to Timothy, which I'm surprised and I'm glad we didn't. We got nothing. A 15 minute opener. How many passages did we see 
promoting scripture alone. None. Rather, he said, well, it's kind of, you know, inferred from a bunch of different things. Where? Where is it inferred from? There's nothing. If this is your foundation and not a single passage is, passage is utilized to prove it, well, I, I think that we're in a bit of a problem. We were told, the brother said, well, I, I made that climb. And then he explicitly said, the climb is an inference. Well, I, I love you, brother, but what did you climb? A playground sand hill? Because if your climb is an inference, uh, we're, we're in deep trouble now. We heard about the assumption of Mary, the Immaculate Conception, the papacy, and that revelation was ongoing. The debate is about scripture alone. None of those topics. But I'll tell you one thing, to be fair to the brother, if he wants to transform this into a Mariology debate, Immaculate Conception, or Assumption of Mary, I'm game for that. You want to, tra you want to transform it into a Mariology debate, Bible and tradition, I am game for that, 100%, or to do that debate in the future. But today's debate is about Scripture alone. Where on earth is the premise of Scripture alone in the Scripture alone? My goodness, you can't even come to the conclusion as to what Scriptura is. You can't even know what Scriptura is without tradition, without sacred tradition. What did the great Athanasius say? This was handed down by the fathers. What did the great St. Cyril of Jerusalem Day say? The divine presidents handed this down. The great Augustine, what did he say? This was handed down by the apostles. Every father you go to when you want to look at the canon, those books that are holy writ, hand it down, hand it down, hand it down. No, you don't see, see Athanasius saying, hey, hold on. Let me get a hold of my Bible over there to come to the conclusion of the sacred list of scriptures. I'm going to pop it open, and I'm going to find it out. No, I'm sorry, but Sola Scriptura fails on many premises. I'm going to uh, surrender the final five seconds of my time. All right. Thank you, William. And thank you, Theo, for that openings and rebuttals so at this time we are going to transition to our cross-examination and this cross-examination be a total of 40 minutes both of you will get 20 minutes each to lead with questions and this cross six let's make sure if we can answer the question with a simple yes or no let's do that, do so let's not balk your opponent's time down along with the questions also i understand that there may be a lead in to the question but let's not make your lead in too long that absorbs a long amount of time. We want to make this a very interactive cross X. All right. With that said, Theo, you're up first for your 20 minute cross examination of William. And I will start your time as soon as you begin to ask your first question. Okay. Hey, thanks, William. I uh, appreciate it, man. Not taking any of this personally or anything. So I, I can. No, no, not this, at so all, I'll... brother. Not at all, brother. Not yeah. at all. All right. Let me, let me get into these questions here. Uh, do you agree that all throughout the Bible, we see this idea that what God says has final authority. The word of God has final authority. Absolutely. Yes. Do you see that all throughout the Bible? That the word of God has final authority. Absolutely. Whether it be written form or oral form, the words of God okay. are, is, are, are the authority. Absolutely. Yes. That, that works. Okay. Has it always been the case that the word of God has final authority? There's never been a time where that was not the case, right? You mean in the Old Testament? Absolutely. As, as I read in my opening and statement the New in, Testament. The, in, in the Old Testament. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, mean, I would say in the Old and the New Testament. Yeah, absolutely. The Word of God, whether oral or passed down, absolutely is the authority. So okay. the difference would be that we don't believe that <clears throat> Scripture alone is the only place where God is speaking. Right. Understood. Understood. Um, so you would agree that there are you can't even put a number on the passages that claim that what god says has final authority it's just all throughout the bible would you agree with that absolutely all throughout the bible all throughout church history okay are the scriptures the word of god yep do you agree that in the bible we see that the scriptures contain what god says to the church yep correct okay does the church submit to the scriptures? Uh, define that. It depends what you mean. Does the church uh, submit to the scriptures? Yield, we believe yield that the to church... its authority. Yield to its authority. Mm -hmm. you, you'd have to break that down. I'm very confused with what you mean. If you mean, if you mean okay. that scripture stands above the teaching authority of the church, no, I do not agree with that at all. We're, we're told quite the opposite in, in, in the Bible, that the pillar and foundation of truth is the church. So that's, it, it, with all due respect, it, okay. it's a little bit so of a... This, a, a the right, so the church does not yield to the authority of Scripture, or does it? That's all I mean, yield. No, I mean, the above, church, below, 
I simply mean yield no, the to the authority of the word of God. It does not yield to the, the authority of the word again, of God. There, again, there's your problem. You, you yes. Notice what you did there. First, you said, does the church yield to the scripture? Notice what you did. And then you switched it and you said, with your premise working with Sola Scriptura, does the church yield to the word of God? All day long, we can say that the church holds up the word of God, okay. but whether or not the church yields to scripture alone, there's a problem. The Bible doesn't teach the idea of scripture alone. So all day long, we can agree upon the right. Bible being the word of God, the scripture being the word of God, but the scripture alone is not the word of God. Right. So, but the church submits. Okay. I, I see what you're saying here, but the church submits. The church to is the a pillar and foundation you, you of truth. Had, right. But the, the, the church chur does submit to the word of God, right? I, I would not use that terminology. I would use the terminology of the church being the upholder, the preserver, and the pillar and foundation of the truth of the word of God, the preserver and the president of the word of God. The language and terminology that you're using, unfortunately, is it, not apostolic terminology. Uh, okay. I mean, either the church submits to the word of God, or I think you just said it does, but you said that the word of God is not only in written form. So at this point, I just want to know right. if the, the church submits to right. the word I, of God, whether oral or so, written, oral or written, does it submit, so me, does it yield to the authority of more, the word of God or oral or written? Once, once more, the church relies on the word of God, but the church is guided by the Holy Spirit. As we, you're going to have to allow me to finish speaking. You're going to have sorry, to allow me to sorry, finish sorry. my point. Yeah. So the, the, the church, the church recognizes the word of God. The church is guided by the Holy Spirit in all of her decisions. But the church, as we see in Acts 15, also gathers and discusses matters amongst themselves and is guided to all truth by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes some of these decisions are not exclusively found within scripture alone, but rather at times in history, they can be found in apostolic tradition. But we believe all apostolic tradition is handed down by Christ. It ultimately comes from the apostles. So we would even argue, if we talk about the canon of scripture, we believe Christ, God is the author of canon, not the apostles. So we would say again, we wouldn't use the language of the church submitting to the scripture. We use the language of the church being the pillar and foundation of truth and the upholder of what the scripture is, whether written or oral. Okay. Uh, does the word of God or do the scriptures submit to the church? It, it has, it's a nonsensical question because the scriptures are not so, uh, a, an animate so thing. When, that can go and right. bow down so when, to the church. So when so Jesus, the question makes no sense. So let me give you an example. So when Jesus commands us to go and preach the gospel, does the church sure. yield to that commandment or is that nonsensical? The church upholds every teaching of Christ, but even the does gospel... Does it yield to it, though? Does hold it on. Yield, does, right. So so the, the way you're asking the <clears throat> questions, the way you're framing them... I've got to be very respectful. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The church obeys the Lord and the church, Christ is the bride of the church. So the way you're setting up the question simply doesn't make any sense. You know, does the bride yield to Christ himself? The church follows all of the teachings of Christ because Christ is ahead. Preaching of the gospel is one particular thing, but even the gospel contains within it oral traditions that were passed down written and oral so there's a problem there when holding the bible alone because even the gospel within it contains oral and written teachings okay so the the church obeys the lord yes christ is ahead of the church is that a yes christ it's 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 a nonsensical question brother i i i hate to break well, it but you i don't just think said that the church obeys catholic the lord. ecclesiology right but you christ just said the is church the head of the church the so Right. right. So, so they obey the head. Hold the on. Head is, so let me. Right. Okay. Sorry. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. So Christ is the head of the church. If we want to talk about the hierarchy, church members, do they obey Christ the head of the church? Without a doubt. Of course. Does, right. Does the magisterium obey the Lord? The teaching authority of the church? Of course. Yes. And the Pope. Do they obey the Lord? Do they obey what the Lord says? Yes, I, I'm, I'm confused how this is what, what this has right. to do with Sola Scriptura. It's about right. Scripture alone, right. not well, about the Pope it, it, or the Magisterium, right, right? Right, but I'm saying they obey what the Lord says. Do the Scriptures contain right. what the Lord says? Do, do the Scriptures contain yes. what the Lord says? What was that? Correct. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Moving on. Are you able to Moving hear me on. okay? Right. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Can, can you hear Thank me? You. Thank okay. you. I don't mean to be so pointed. I don't mean to be so pointed. No, no, I, I'm just, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I'm not trying to be rude, brother, but I, I've yet yeah, to no receive problem. a single question on the thesis. Right. Okay. I'll, I'll let the viewers decide if that, that hit the thesis here, but let me move on here. Okay. Uh, do you agree that public revelation ceased after the death of the last apostle? Absolutely. Are the scriptures public revelation? Yes. Okay. Public divine revelation. The, right. Do you agree that the Pharisees sat in the seat of Moses? Yes, they did. But they, they rather than following the teachings that Moses handed down, they overstepped those boundaries and held to things that would have, as Irenaeus said, constituted watery traditions, and they went against the word of God. Right. Okay, so, but you agree at least sat in the seat of Moses. Do you agree that the Roman Catholic Church sits in the seat of Peter? No. They don't occupy, that's no, not, that, their, that's not that, their center of authority, the seat of Peter? That, that's, a, that, that's a very, that's very odd question. St. Saint Peter, St. Saint Peter's seat is sat in by the vicar of Christ, by the Pope. We don't use the language to say that the Roman church sits in the seat of Peter. We use the language of the Pope, the vicar of Christ, because we only have one reigning at a particular time that seats. And he is the, the it, and he is, and he is the, uh, the bishop of the Roman church, correct? He's the, le he, he's the head of the church, right? The vicar. As the John Roman 21 church, right? says, he, as, as John 21 says, he is the shepherd of the whole church. He's the shepherd of the flock. And as Luke 22 okay. clearly tells us, he is the one that strengthens the brethren. He is the one that has the keys. Right. He is I got indeed you. the Pope. Yes. Right. So I, I think that's a yes and around it, just different semantics. Do you agree that the I don't Pharisees... Think so. Right. Well, the, the... at all, the like, it's church? very confusing. Where is... Right. Where is the yeah, Roman it's, church? It's confusing there... because... It's confusing okay. language because it 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 can it can attempt to lead people to believe that the other hierarchy, the other members, have an equal standing to the role of the Pope. It's a confusing kind of question. It's one that, with all due right. respect, shows that you don't understand the doctrine of the papacy. Right. I, okay. I'll let the uh, I'll let the, the listeners uh, determine if I if I got that right there. That's no problem there. Do you agree that the Pharisees thought that their tradition was infallible? Uh, they thought that it was, that it dated to ancient times and they thought that it was godly. That's correct. Okay. I don't think they would have used the word that... infallible. That word doesn't appear in the Bible. Right. You're probably right. But they thought it was uh, it as doesn't. binding as Torah, as Torah. Uh, they they thought that, that it was Roman... binding and authoritative. Right. On the level of Torah. Sure. Right. Okay. Do you agree that the Roman Catholic Church thinks their oral tradition is infallible? Or at least their sacred tradition. With, yeah, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, sacred tradition is the word of God as well. According to 1 Thessalonians as well, and all over scripture, according to the Bible itself, the scriptura, yeah, oral oral teaching is the word of God as well. Okay. Did the Pharisees claim their infallible tradition went all the way back to Moses? Yeah. Okay. Does the Roman Church claim their infallible tradition goes all the way back to the apostles? Goes back to Christ, absolutely. Every single teaching okay. can be proven either. Hold on, hold on. Let, let me answer that. Uh, every every single teaching can be proven from the Word of God. Remember, the Word of God is not limited to Bible only, but every teaching of ours, at least implicitly, I'd say ninety nine percent, are either explicit or implicit in the Scriptura itself. There are a few that would be that you would need outside testimony and tradition for, such as the canon of scripture. All right. So even though the Pharisees sat in the cathedra of Moses, their oral tradition wasn't always correct, correct? That's correct, because they went against the commandment of God, we're told. The Lord tells us that they went against the commandment of God and they held to not as two Thessalonians or any of these other passages tell us, they held to traditions of men. So there's a huge problem there. If you hold to traditions of men and elevate them above the word of God, you, you got a massive problem there. Right. 
When refuting the oral traditions of the Pharisees, did Jesus appeal to the scriptures as the final authority, or did he appeal to some infallible oral tradition? He appealed to the word of the Lord. So there's a huge problem there because word of the Lord, when word of the Lord is utilized, it's never utilized to be confined to scripture alone. So as I pointed out in okay. my opening and rebuttal, hold on, hold on, I'm not done, I'm not done. Yeah, go, as yeah, I pointed out in my opening and, re, and, and rebuttal, I know we have a tiny little lag, so I, I don't want to sound like I'm being rude or anything. But as I pointed out, this is very often quoted, but I'm, I, I want to emphasize again, it's not about sacred scripture against sacred tradition. It's about bad traditions, traditions of men making no, and I mentioned this earlier, what holy God etched in the tablets and handed on to Moses on Mount Sinai. And as Dr. Brock, the theologian and Syriac scholar has pointed out, that wasn't only confined to the scriptura. Okay, well, did you, when Jesus rebukes the Pharisees in Mark 7, does he appeal to the written scripture or does he appeal to some oral tradition? He, he appeals to the word of the Lord. I just answered it for you. And was, the word was, of the Lord is it, not in, confined in, in its to the form. I know, but broadly speaking, but in this particular passage, was he appealing to in its the written, written form? tradition? Yes. He's a, he's no, he's not appealing to the written alone. He's appealing so when, to when, the word. When Catholic on, scholars, answer, like, I, I, I got to yeah, answer go that. I, yeah, I got go to answer that. Uh, when he refers to the word of the Lord, and I suggest you do a, a, a study on the word, word of the Lord. You can do a word study in the TLG, the Thesaurus Lingua Greci. The word of the Lord is not only written, it was etched in stone on Mount Sinai. He's referring to that. That's why we're told that the commandments are what is not being held to. So the word of the Lord is written, etched on stone, and oral. So it's not referring to a scripture passage alone. It's referring to a commandment that is not being held to. Where did they, it was one of the Ten Commandments, correct? And where do you find those Ten Commandments at that time? Where were they? Where, did they still have the stone tablets? Or were they written on a, on a you scroll? Were, well, the stone tablets existed for a while. They existed for some time, and then it was preserved orally, and then it was preserved written as well, all throughout history. So, of course, I, I don't think that you're asserting that it was preserved only written in a kind of scroll that everybody had a, a hold of. No, this was held to orally, passed down. So we knew of the Ten Commandments that they were originally etched on stone. So, again, word of the Lord is not confined to Scripture alone. Yeah, right. A Jew in one of the, in a, a first century Jew in the synagogue, where would they find the Ten Commandments? In the synagogue, they could find yeah. the Ten were they, Commandments. Were they written down? Were they written, or were they was this all they, oral? They, they were point? in scroll. They were in scrolls, and they were preached. Remember, remember what we're told in the Gospels. We're told when we hear of the law and we hear of the commandments, we're told that the word of the Lord is what is heard and passed down. So the word of the Lord would not only be confined to a scroll or written down, or else how else would people have heard the word of the Lord, brother? They are hearing the word of the Lord. Remember what sacred tradition is? I want to be very clear for the audience. Sacred tradition is what is passed down. So it can be, it can be the same thing. It can be in written form, and it can be passed on. We agree there that a lot of, the, a lot of it is the same form, but it's not an exclusivity in the sense that everything right. that is written is also passed down, uh, it's simply not the case. Right. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, were they written? They were etched. On tablets? <laughs> they were etched Is in, that the same tablets. thing as, yeah, they were written. Correct? Absolutely they were not. Written. They were etched in tablets. They yeah. were etched okay, by, so by the finger of God. It, it, it's very different. Yeah. And etching it's not, is not a writing? Were there words, etching is etching. Were there words, they, were there words etched on stone? Absolutely, there were words that were etched okay. in stone, which okay. that's, does that's not fine. support scripture alone. Let me, unless you, unless we're holding to to uh, to to the law alone, to script to the Ten Commandments right. alone. Right. Let me move on here. I, I don't want to run out of time. Uh, generally speaking, would you agree that there is is there a high survival rate for things that are two thousand years old? Not a whole lot, unless you're part of the Catholic Church, which preserves by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit working within it, which preserves all truth because of the promise of our Lord. There's not a whole lot of good survival rate. Right. Did the Pharisees claim that they preserved teachings from Moses? Sure. Were they right or wrong about those teachings? They were wrong about the Korban rule. 
they were definitely wrong about that. And they were wrong about a whole okay. lot, a whole lot of other stuff where I would say they were right about uh, probably would have been certain scriptures, which would have uh, uh, predicted uh, the resurrection. But outside of that, they got a whole lot wrong, which is why they were rebuked. Because remember, they didn't hold to what? The word of the Lord. They superseded the word of the Lord. And one thing that we're going to agree on all day and all night here, brother, is that the word of the Lord is the standard. But how is the word of the Lord the standard? Is it Bible alone or is it Bible and sacred tradition? And all throughout the scripture itself, it's, it's, it's both. Can you name one apostolic teaching that we have today that comes from God but is not found in Scripture? I can name multiple. Uh, do you want me to just name one or do you want me to name multiple? Uh, we'll start with one now and we'll, we'll, we'll move forward. Canon of Scripture. The canon of Scripture is, is, is apostolic, as the early church fathers taught. We believe God is the author of canon. Not any church father, not any pope. God is the author of canon. That is apostolic. There's no way on earth they're going to find that in the scripture itself. Uh, and, and that's pretty massive. How did the church know which books were scripture? Did they decide this? So or, that's a great question. Things? No. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't decide it. Uh, because remember, God is the author of canon. If we say that the church gathered together and they decided, hey, this book, that book, no, they recognized the canon. How did they do that? As Augustine tells us, uh, they queried the apostolic churches. They contacted all of the apostolic churches to see which books were the ones being read at mass. Cyril of Jerusalem tells us that the apostles handed them down. St. Athanasius says the apostles handed them down. And Augustine tells us that they come from the apostles. But how do they come towards knowing what the canon is? They queried the apostolic churches. This is tradition. They reached out to them to see what is the tradition upheld at Holy Mass, which books are being read from, and that's how they determined which books were canonical. They didn't sit down and decide Did, and, play, and draw straws. Right. Did the church utilize the canon that they had, the scriptures that they had, in order to help them discern canonical books? Did the church... Oh, did the church look within the Bible itself to decide like which we're, books were Like, for example, maybe I could rephrase it this way. Yeah. Um, I, I know you're familiar with Lee Martin McDonald. I know you've read yeah, definitely. his books. Now he, He's endorsed he our kind of surveys. He surveys the fathers, and I'll get to a question yeah. here. And usually when you survey the fathers, they have, they have certain criteria that they use to determine whether a book was canonical. One of those being apostolicity. Where definitely. Did the church apostolicity. Get this? Yes. Where did the church get the idea that apostolicity mattered? Did they just create that out of thin air? They or got they get it because that from it, the Gospels. No, they got that directly from sacred tradition. They got that from the tradition okay, that. Where did, hold on, hold on. Let me yeah, let me answer. Right, yeah, th th yeah, this is it. a very this is the very reason why every father that talks about the canon, they tell you this was passed down from the apostles. You're not going to find any of them saying, well, we cracked open the Bible and we read the scriptura to decide that these books must be part of the scriptura. It doesn't make any sense at all. They relied solely on sacred tradition for that. I've read Kruger's thesis, brother, and I got to be very clear. Uh, Lee Martin McDonald wouldn't agree with that thesis. I think it's a mess. Right. All right. That's, that's oh, time right okay, there. That that's time yeah. right there. All right, William, you're up for your 20 minute cross examination of Theo. And I'll start your time when you ask your first question. Give, give me one second. I gotta, I gotta switch my, uh, uh, give me a second. I need to get my timer as well. This is awesome. Okay, by the way, here we go. I'm having fun. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. great brother. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Uh, here is, is my question to you. Um, in your canon problem video, uh, in my, you, you swipe away at the Deuterocanonical books very early on, and you say that Protestantism is about retrieval, retrieving the earliest teachings of Christ and the apostles. At the 20-minute mark, you say that in the earliest times of church, the Deuterocanon were not considered inspired. My question for you is, what council exists any early church council, every single one, where the scripture is listed, where the Deuter or Canon are lacking? I honestly think that this is probably off topic because we're not debating the inspiration you brought the of the Deuter Canon. Well, you, you brought the Canon uh, up, so I'm carrying uh, it along. How did I? 
I'm not sure that I brought the cannon up. You asked me about the cannon. You should, no, but, you brought um, it up. This, in your again, I, asked, I asked you what a tradition was that's not found in scripture, and you said the cannon. I didn't. I didn't. You mentioned the cannon up, as well in the opening. So it's a, it's a simple okay. question because okay. It, okay. it has to do. Right. I think it's. With, I think it's. Right. I think it, no, I think but, it's off topic because we're not debating the Deutero canon. But what I would say briefly, since this is this, well, uh, we're debating what makes up the scriptura. Well, we're already granting the scriptura because the topic is is so no, you can you can, biblical. You can biblical well, you can means that we're already assuming the Bible. But what so I would say disagree. is that if you what, what I would what I would point to what I'd have readers point or listeners point to is go look at the work of uh, John Mead and and, um, and and Gallagher and they. They present a uh, canon list, the earliest uh, Latin list, the I've earliest read, read Greek list. It, yeah, I'm sure you have because you, you've worked on these. But the uh, further back you go, the less you see deuterocanonical books on these canon lists. So I, I'm not going to say that that in and of itself is is the silver bullet. But what I would say is that there has always been a tradition that these books are separate. There has always been a debate. You go all a the tradition? way to What's that the tradition? Council of... What's that? Where's that tradition? You you just said there's always been a tradition that these books have been separate. Where is that tradition? It, it's it's in these canon lists. There is a trend. There is some reason. Where did Jerome get what, this? Where, where so, so, I, I, well, I got to tell you, this is my cross examination. First off, it, it hold is. On. It is. I this still is feel like this is very off topic. But so but go so ahead. I got to be very clear. You're 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 you're. It's not off topic. This has to do with the scriptura. So you we are already you, granting you the scriptura. I'm not granting your scripture list. So we are. We, we don't look, agree on the 66 you, books. We don't so agree on those. Okay. Partially. So okay. I asked you to give me one council where any of these scripture, any of these deuterocanonical books are not present. And you ask people to read Mead and other okay. people. I'll ask you again is there one council right. where any of these deuterocanonical books are not there? Right. I would not say that there is a single council. Again, this is very off topic. But I would not say that there is a single council, but that's the debate is not solved just on a council alone, because, you know, as well as I do, that this has been an ongoing debate even past these councils. You have Cardinal Catajan, Cardinal Jimenez in the Council of Trent. They are still appealing to the tradition of Jerome. So we can't no, say you know, even if a council. Yeah, even if a Trent council does not appeal to Jerome, these Jerome. books. What's so that? so let me let, let me let me go back to that. Okay, go ahead. My question was very yeah. simple. My question was simple. My question was asking if you could name any of the early church councils that would have lacked them. And now you went all the way to Trent. It's now you you can't find right, one because it's one. a bigger picture than it's a bigger picture than just but, a council. But but my question to you was not about the bigger picture. It was about if there are any early councils that lacked. No, I, I would not that I know of. I would say not okay. that I know of. Then but that, then that, that would be in and of itself answer. is not the end of the debate. That's all that I would, would say a, to that. But I that that would right. be a straightforward answer then that there's okay. not yeah, a single one lacking them. So right. at the but seventh that's not at the, the seventh end of the minute, debate. Right. And you guys I never said that it was. And you guys, let's make sure we're not talking over each other. You guys are sort of talking over each other. It's hard to really keep up. Also, let's try to centralize those questions on Sola Scriptura Biblical. I know you're, I, William, I know you're leading to your question. I, 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 I'm let's, sorry, let's Marlon. To, I'm, Marlon, I'm sorry, buddy. Marley, you didn't interrupt when he when he went into the papacy and all other things. So don't interrupt when it's my turn. He talked about papacy and all kinds of things that are off topic, and not once did you interrupt. So I'm going to ask questions that have to do with the scriptura. The Deuter Canon does have to do with the scriptura. At the 738 minute mark, you said that every apostolic tradition can be found within scripture. So my question to you is: since the early fathers believed this was an apostolic tradition. Where do we find the 66 book canon list in the scriptura itself? Okay, is this is this this is relating to a video that's is this no. the video uh, No, this is your opening what? statement. You said that every apostolic statement? tradition every apostolic tradition you said could be right, found right. Well, in scripture. Well, right. I I simply I I what I argued was that we don't have anything else that's not in scripture that we don't have an oral tradition that's not in scripture today. So how do you and get to the so, canon from the Bible itself? I would point listeners to uh, Michael Kruger's self-authenticating. But, but I'm, I'm asking you, though. I'm not asking they, you to, to read you, Kruger. When you say, when you ask the canon being in the Bible, are you talking about a table of contents 
or no, I'm I mean, asking I'm you, sure how thinking. do you come to your list? You hold, let me, let me be clear. You hold the 66 list canon that most Protestants hold to. I don't, I, with yes. all due respect, brother, I don't want to hear you pointing people to Kruger. This is a scripture only debate. Where in the scripture itself, where in the Bible alone, can you come to the conclusion that those books and only those books are biblical? This is this is really off topic. We're 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 not off discussing to the canon. It is. Scripture we're alone. Not discussing. You're we, telling me that the, what the, the scripture the, comprises yes, is off topic. Because the topic is is sola scriptura biblical. We're already presupposing and, the Bible. And I, no, I am. We're not I am saying no, is wrong. which books no. are in the Bible. That's brother. I am pointing out to an apostolic tradition. Notice, for me to debunk you, I have to point to an apostolic tradition. So I'm pointing to one right. to refute scripture alone. So very simple. Right. My apostolic tradition that I'm saying isn't in the Bible. As you said, all apostolic traditions are in the Bible itself. Where is okay. this? This, that's an apostolic tradition. Where is it in the Bible alone? And please don't point people to okay. Kruger. I, Show I, us I'm, the audience. I'm going, to point, I'm, I'm going to point people to Kruger because the church, okay. the thesis Kruger makes is not that there is a, uh, a table of contents in the scripture. If you think that's my claim, then that's a straw man. What I would say rather is that God puts the church in a proper epistemic environment by which they can discern scripture. Now, you know as well as I do that the church had uh, the vast majority of the New Testament without, they weren't even to dispute. Uh, the you're letters incorrect. of Paul were not in dispute. You're, you, you, you are incorrect. You are incorrect. You, you, when, did, you, you're when, wrong. when was the book of Romans? It, it, I can't ask this you is this. My, this I is would, my cross-examination. Yes, you're let right. Me, you're me, right. I'm sorry. Let me go forward. Let me go forward. You're, you're wrong about that. Yes, revelation go ahead. Go ahead. was in debate. Well, Hebrews okay. was in debate. So you, you're I, wrong about that. I didn't say that, revelation. But, I said the vast majority. 20 books sure. in the New Testament were not in debate. They were right, not in dispute. Here's the interesting thing. Prologomena, the anti okay. was in debate. Okay, okay, okay. Guys, you guys are Sorry. talking over each other again. We need to so make sure we're, okay. we're hearing each other. I know you want yeah, to respond no, quickly, Sorry. but let's try to allow William yeah. to ask this question, and then, okay. Theo, you respond. Here was the problem, Theo. The problem is, is this right here, brother. The problem is you say, well, uh, the majority of the New Testament were, 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 were accepted in the beginning. Well, here is your problem. Every time the majority of the New Testament were accepted, the Deuterocanon were as well. Every single early council that gathered where the New Testament was present, so was the Deuterocanon. That's why I have heavily relied on this, because you read from the Westminster Confession of Faith in a video you did where it says everything for faith and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or may be deduced from Scripture. Yet you can't even deduce the books that make up your scriptura for us, and you're telling people to go look at Michael Kruger. I'm asking you, how do you know those 66 books as the Westminster Confession of Faith laid down for you? Those are the scriptura and the scriptura alone. I haven't give, been given a straight answer even once. Okay, well, this is going to be a longer, a longer answer. Um, Kruger's thesis, like I, I gave you, I gave you an, uh, I gave Dr. you an example. Of, uh, okay, yes, I. It, it's it's it's. I would recommend people read his book because no, I'm not going to be able to get this out. I, I, I only let have me, let me minutes. answer the question. Yeah, William, but before you answer, answer the question. Yeah, yeah. Before you answer, the, let me just say this. Let me. Yeah. Try try yeah. to answer really fast because my time is running out, and don't yes, go long winded and Kruger. Go ahead. Right. Okay. Here's what I would say: is the church was able to discern canonical books from the canon that they had. They had a canon. They had the Old Testament. I'm not saying it was complete. They had the Old Testament scriptures. They had 20 books of the New Testament that were never in dispute. They had the oral tradition of the apostles, which is the same teachings you find in the New Testament. So how do we know a book is canonical? Why would uh, a, a, a apostolicity matter? Where would the church even know what an apostle is? They get it from the gospels. They get it from the, the oral teaching of the apostles. They get it from the gospel itself. So the church was able to discern canonical books, the books in question, by appealing to that to the canon that they did have, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna, every I'm book was. I'm going to ask another question. Every now. book was up in the air. That's so my I'm going to ask answer. another question. It, yeah, it, it's yes. not an answer. You you didn't give us an yeah. answer. It, rather, you said how I one can discern how one can discern a book is apostolic and holy. You well, the, know well, the church has the to answer. discern. You, you, so in order right. to be able to even know which books be, are part of the scriptura, you've got to go to that nasty thing, that sacred tradition, because you don't find the actual list or scriptura within the Bible itself. That's the problem. My next question is, you are an Arminian. Why is your canon of scripture 
that you hold to different from the books that were scripture of Jacob Arminius? How do you come to your version of scriptura if the scriptura of Jacob Arminius was different from yours? He utilized the Deuterocanonical text. So how, is script, how, how do you come to your conclusion of determining what is scriptura if the scriptura of the very namesake of your religion is different from yours? Well, I would rely on consensus. I would rely on uh, just the, the best overall historical case. I, I don't rely, I, I, even though I'm a Protestant, I don't, I don't hold Jacob Arminius or any single figure as my, this is my authority. I, I look so at you, what, who makes the best case. And I, I think the best case, as far as why the Deuterocanonical is not inspired, is that it's, it's not apostolic. It's, it's, it's not considered so me, inspired. Then that's why so, I, I, I think that's, that's, let me be I, very I clear. Really go with the best case I can find. I, I want to be very clear for the audience here. You're unable to give us a single early council that lacked the Deuterocanon. The very namesake of your religion used the Deuterocanon, not only used it, but used it as sacred scripture. But your scripture is different from the very namesake of your, of the founder of your religion, yet you're telling us to hold a solo scriptura. Is that correct? <laughs> Jacob Arminius is not the founder of my religion, my friend. Jesus Christ is. The namesake so of your religion. Do, at the end, you are an Arminian. Well, it's 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 a view. It's it's no different than being an a, a, a Augustinian or a, uh, a Thomas. So let, let me, you know, that doesn't mean, me that, that doesn't mean Thomas Aquinas is the founder of your religion. I, I find this I very, very perplexing. I just hold this view. I hold this philosophy. I, I find it very perplexing. I've got to be honest, brother, that you hold to a dip. You, you're telling people the scriptura, this is clear. Uh, it's in the Bible, yet it clearly, for the namesake of your religion, maybe I won't say founder, for the very namesake of your religion, his scriptura was different. How does that make any sense? You come to a different conclusion of scriptura. Is it, hold on. I already the answered consensus, this. I already answered this. Is, is your, okay, so the consensus that you look at, you have some kind of insight that Jacob Arminius didn't have. Well, is that correct? I, I would say, well, I would say that everybody has to do an investigation, the Roman Catholic Church included. Everyone has to rely on consensus of some sort. You can only rely on the best consensus. So the Roman Catholic Church, they don't include every single book you find in the Septuagint. That's why you don't find third and fourth Esdras in their canon. But that, that, why? But that's because never they, been had, the case. they had to do an investigation. Are these books canonical? We're doing the same thing as, as Protestants. Are these books canonical? When we look at the evidence, we don't think that they are. The earliest evidence, we look at the Jewish evidence, we don't think that these books are. And wonderful. Where is the Jewish evidence? Has never been settled. What's that? Where is the Jewish evidence? Give me the earliest Jewish historian that would have held to your sixty-six book canon. In, in the second clearly, cent clearly. in the second century, the Jews do not. When when they finally canonize their scriptures, they do not include the Deuterocanon as inspired. I just asked you. There is there's quote quote a scholar for yeah. me because I don't agree with you. Josephus does. He quotes from Deuteresto. Deuteresto. And he right. I, I, I can't name you as I, all I would say to people listening is uh, it's it, it's either true or not that the Jews today at some point canonized their Bible and it does not include the Deuteronomy. Not, not in the first or the second include. century. Not in the first or the second century. You told the us. Second century they did. You the told us. No, they did. Did. I'm asking you. I have asked you over and over, brother. Second century, yeah. quote me one. You've got Josephus. Quote I, me I, one. I, I didn't come here to debate the canon. I didn't come. I don't have my you came names. to debate. Scriptura. All I'm saying is that what's yeah. You came to we're, debate. We're already scriptura. presupposing the Bible, my friend. We're presupposing. No, we're not. The Bible. We're, not we're not. This isn't a debate about whether yours. the Deutero canon is inspired. Okay. We're not debating the Deutero canon. So let, 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 let me let me be very but, clear here. I got five, but all I I five minutes. Is either, I have five minutes. Okay. Okay. Yes, I, you're I right. have five I'm minutes. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I got five minutes. Let me be very clear here. You made a number of statements. You're making the statements, and then right away you're saying, well, I didn't come to debate this. You made the statement that in the second century, the 100s, the Jews had a normative canon that wasn't with a Deuterocanon. canon. That has a lot to do with the scriptura to me, and you're wrong, and I'm asking you for one Jew. There was Josephus in the 100s, and you're not able to list one for me. My issue is, is that you're incorrect when you say that we come to the table with, a, with the same scriptura. We do not. We don't. Even the truncated 66, what do you use? Are you using Deuter Esther or the shorter version of Esther? Because the Jews debated that way later into history. So my problem is this. I'm looking at the very namesake of your religion, brother, and he uses wisdom, Sirach, uh, all these other Deuterocanonical books that you called apocryphal. 
How does he come to a different version of scriptura and you come to your version? How do you determine what is the scriptura for you? I, I think I already answered that. And uh, okay. it's, it's. Okay. Let me move to another question. You, if you think that you already you answered that. Yeah. yeah okay. Yes. Well, I'll let the, let the listeners. The, that, well, that's the thing. You got to make a case rather than just saying, make the best case. You, you told us a lot about Michael Kruger, well, but I, I, I didn't see a case being made. I, so remember what I said, brother. This, for me, is an apostolic tradition. And we're pitting tradition against Scripture. You're asking me, you're, you asked me earlier to name one yeah. apostolic tradition, not in the okay. Scriptura. I named the canon. This is an apostolic tradition. And you said everything, yes. and you read the Westminster in a video you made. Well, so uh, well, how do you determine your canon of Scripture? I haven't heard anything about that. Right. So let, let, let well, me, I, let I, me I started to explain there. it. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I, I've been. I started to explain I, I can, it. I'll give you a chance again if you want. Tell it. Let me yeah, let me sure. do it again. Let me let me frame another question. Okay. How is it? How is it that the sola scriptura version of the namesake of your religion is different from yours? Tell us why your standard is better than the very namesake of your religion. Well, I already answered this in part. I would say it's it's by consensus by doing the best investigation, which everybody has to do. Roman Catholic Church has to investigate which which books are inspired and which aren't. Everybody does this, Protestants included. And like I said, I hold to the self-authenticating model of canon that Kruger holds to. Uh, the church was able to discern which books were canon by appealing to the canon that they had. They already had the uh, prolegomena or homologomena, and these books were already accepted. There was no dispute on that. So what they had to dispute were the books that were questionable. But how did they know that those, what did they even, how did they even know what to look for? by appealing to the canon that they had. And I already gave you an example of apostolicity. Why would a book have to be uh, apostolic? Where would they get this idea from? They didn't just make this up. The tr tradition didn't just come out oh. of nowhere. They got this from the gospels. They knew from the gospels I'm gonna move that on the apostles I got, I got were two Christ's only. mouthpiece. So I, 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 got I can't two answer only, this brother, in, and, and, yeah, go ahead, Again, you, you are wrong. Every, every assertion you made is incorrect. And I've asked you for times in history to prove this. I've asked you for figures in church history. I've asked you for Jews. You're just making assertions and telling people to go read Michael Kruger. And we've, we've gone nowhere with that because you can't give us what I what I want just, is some meat are, and potatoes. Right. Right. So you want a name, but that's, that's, your, that's a red herring. That's a red herring to whether the Jews actual ev excluded actual the evidence is a red herring. Actual the Jews evidence excluded the Deuterocanon. No, they did Me not. Right? citing a scholar is a uh, right herring. No, they did not. Okay, guys, let's 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 get out of control. Let's settle down. William, yeah. ask your question. You have a minute and a half. Let's ask your question. Let's let, go let, ahead. Let me ask not Theo to answer so, your question. So, in two in two Timothy, is it not true that everything we read about Scripture being profitable for profitable for teaching, equipping for good works, and being kept by the Holy Spirit? Is it not true that everything we read for scripture in 2 Timothy is also said for tradition? Are you you said that in, in a video. Three? Yes, in a video that you made, you said to 2 Timothy 3 that this points to sola scriptura because these things are not said of tradition, yet they are also said of tradition. So I'm asking you, why would you say that in that video if everything said for scripture profitable for teaching, equipping you for good works, and completing right. you by the power of the Holy I, Spirit. I, I, I don't know where Timothy, I, I don't know where Paul says this about tradition, where he says that tradition okay. is profitable, useful for correction, teaching, reproof. I, I am not aware of a verse where Paul says that about tradition. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, where he says, commit these to faithful men who will teach others into righteousness, 2 Thessalonians 2 2, where he talks about what is handed down will lead you to the glory of the Lord. And 1 Thessalonians, right. well, my time. I don't, my hear, time I don't hear anything about this is useful for teaching, correction, reproof. I just I'm read not it. denying it. The passage, the, those passages did not mention teaching, reproof, correction. They, they don't, only only 2 Timothy, they, they, when it refers they, to they, scripture, they mentioned teaching. Everything right. said there that the, is also mentioned. All right. All right, guys, that's time right I there for it. the final round of Cross X. So, all right, um, we are going to transition to our five-minute closings, uh, guys. Um, time is of the essence here, so I don't want to hold you guys too much longer. So, uh, Theo, you're up for your five-minute closing, and I will start your time as soon as you begin to speak. 
Okay, here we go. All right, William, thank you so much, man. I don't take any of this personally. I like wrestling. I like grappling. I, I like a good invigorating uh, debate. So I'm not mad if you're not mad. So here's what I would say in closing that uh, William is, is saying that um, I have not made my case. I did not point to a scripture. But remember in my opener, I never said that my case is based on a single scripture. I said it's it's based on the Bible at large. And William has did not denied this. He has affirmed one of my premises that throughout the Bible, we see that what God says has final authority. And then I made an inference to saying that if nothing else we possess today contains what God says besides the scriptures, then my argument goes through. So that's that's my entire argument. My argument is not based on a scripture. So that's that's he's misunderstanding my argument there. Um, so the overall point is that I made a inference. I made a, uh, a syllogism. The only way that William can refute my argument is to refute is to deny one of the premises. It's not clear that he's denied any of them, except he possibly he's brought up the canon as a possible uh, apostolic tradition not found in scripture. Uh, what I would say to that is, is during cross X, I don't have time. This is a, this was off topic. I'm not here to debate the formation of the canon. The topic of the debate today is, is Sola Scriptura biblical? We're already assuming the Bible. We already are, are coming together on common ground. We're not discussing the Deutero canon. We're not here to, uh, to, to, to debate whether the Deutero canon is inspired. We are coming together on common ground on the passages we already agree on, which is a 66 book canon. So it's a red herring for me to try to prove the canon in in the middle in, in 10 seconds in in a uh, cross X. I want the viewer I want the viewer to listen and understand to this. Uh, so what I would do is point the viewer to the work of Michael Kruger. He explains how the uh, the canon is not an extra biblical tradition. The church was able to discern the canon with the help of the scriptures and the canon that they had. It does not have to have a table of contents. When the church knows what, uh, they, they know that apost apostolicity matters, they're getting this from scripture. They're getting this from the idea that Jesus commissioned the apostles. Jesus used the apostles as his mouthpiece. So they're drawing these criteria, they're drawing these features from the scriptures. This is why the canon is not an extra biblical tradition. So at the end of the day, William has not refuted premise four. He brought up, uh, he, 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 we just got steamrolled in a cross X. But at the end of the day, the canon is not a, uh, it's not an extra biblical tradition. Um, so again, I just want to remind the viewer that in order for him to refute my argument, he has to show an apostolic tradition that is not found in scripture. The canon is not it. He has not brought up any other one. Um, also, he has not shown that Mark 7 is more, is, is, uh, does not, is not made better sense of on the sola scriptura hypothesis. Those are the two things that he was supposed to show. If he cannot show those, then my argument goes through. He has to deny a premise. That's how arguments work. We, we're, we're going all over the place talking about the canon and all these other things. That's irrelevant. And I preempted that at, at, in, in my opener. So I'll leave it to the viewer to decide uh, who, uh, who's the, who's uh, case, uh, uh, who, who carried the stronger case. And, uh, but I do want to, uh, again, I just want to thank uh, William. I want to thank uh, Marlon uh, for this debate, having a lot of fun with it. And I don't take any of this personally, and I concede my time. All right. Thank you, Theo, for that. And I appreciate you as well. And so, William, you're up for your five-minute closing. And let me get you set up here. All right. Let me know when I can All right. Be. And you can start. Uh, I'll start your time. You begin to speak. All right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, nothing personal at all, brother. Uh, I just, uh, I, I love my faith and um, I wear my faith on my shoulder, on my shoulder. <laughs> I wear my faith proudly right here in my chest. Um, so yeah, let me go into the closing immediately. Um, there are a number of problems here. Uh, the brother thought that we uh, came to the table agreeing on what actually made up the scriptura. Uh, that again, in and of itself is a problem. Uh, he then said the Jews rejected the Apocrypha. Well, I asked him to name one. He said, well, by the second century, it was normative. I asked him to name one, and every time I ask for something, he wants you to go read Mead. He wants you to go read Kruger. Go read something else. I can't name it for you. Go read them. I am unable to name it, but read them. 
if you're going to answer and make an assertion, you better be able to answer it. Imagine me saying something and then saying, well, go read that guy. I asked him, how do you even know what makes up the scriptura? Well, you look at the books and you look at how, uh, how they determine the apostolicity. Doesn't matter. I've read Kruger's model. It's atrocious. How does it help you decide which books are canonical? We can agree all day long that a book that is apostolic, or even if you use the standard from the Bible to determine what is canonical, even if you use that, how do you end up at your list? It's impossible. You need sacred tradition. And by that very virtue, it destroys Sola Scriptura. If you need to go into tradition to even know what the Scriptura is, you've already lost. And we entered very dangerous territory because the very namesake of his religion, he's an Arminian, and he can't even agree on the canon with Jacob Arminius. He says, well, how do I get to mine? Well, consensus. So the consensus he has is better than Jacob Arminian. Or Arminius, excuse me. He's an Arminian. Jacob Arminius used wisdom, Sirach, and many other deuterocanonical books. He would, have di he would have disagreed. He would have rebuked the brother on the scriptura because he tells you stick to scripture. So they can't even agree on what makes the scriptura. And you're telling me he wants you to believe his word, that his, the standard of solar scriptura is the one to hold to? When he can't even agree with the, with the very namesake of his religion? I have to be very clear. I am in utter shock. Go read Michael Kruger. Go read 100 authors. You're never going to find out what books make up your canon unless you go to sacred tradition. He said that this was um, a clear problem, that this was not a problem. Well, of course he's going to say that. He asked me earlier to name one apostolic tradition, and I named one. Well, not good enough for him. He doesn't agree with it being apostolic, so it's off topic. He doesn't agree that it's apostolic, so it's off topic. I can tell you it's very much on topic. If it is an apostolic tradition, he says, well, I don't agree with it. Really? Every father that talked about these lists, by the way, the list of meat and those, even those lists that are produced, they utilize the Deuterocanon as holy writ. Even those utilize it as holy writ. So there's a problem there. You need divine tradition. Every father that talks about a list, how do they get to it? Well, did they crack open the Bible and get to it? No. They relied on sacred tradition. Of course, that's off topic for the brother because he doesn't like it, because he knows he can't find it in the Bible. So, of course, it's off topic. I'm telling you, we got nothing today from him. We're told that the, the tradition of the elders, tradition of men, who supports that thesis? Irenaeus or any father that interpreted that? None of them. And then he wanted to argue that etched in stone is the same as scripture, scripture alone. We need to be a little bit serious here. We got nothing. We didn't even get one verse. I didn't even hear from 2 Timothy until I brought it up. We didn't get anything. But rather, we saw that there is an apostolic tradition. I didn't get time to bring up many more. There are others. But we saw that there is an apostolic tradition, the canon, the very list of books that make up the scriptura. I don't care if you tell me, well, they cracked it open and they, by virtue of, of, of the Gospels, they decided these books belong in the Bible. Even if you do that, you don't get to the Scriptura with that because the list is not in the Bible itself. You need sacred tradition. And interestingly enough, again, yeah, I'm going to harp on it, the very founder of his religion, the namesake of his religion, Jacob Arminius, didn't even agree with him on his version of Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura is unbiblical. Happy Halloween, everybody. All right. Thank you guys for a very, I guess I can say, uh, feisty debate. I still love um, the brother. Uh, and I, you know, and I sort of is expected uh, when we're dealing with such a sensitive topic, it's all the scriptura. I, I just wouldn't go trick or treating. That was a, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is expected. And uh, yeah. So thank you guys for the debate. I appreciate you guys. And so i um, not sure if you guys have time for a Q and A. Um, there is, I know you guys have to skedaddle, so uh, I'll leave that um, in you guys' maybe hands. Maybe five minutes, maybe five minutes. 
Yeah, five I, I have I have about yeah, I have about five too. All right, so we'll ask a couple questions here. Uh, both of you guys will get a minute each to act, to, uh, to answer the question. So uh, I'll get one for Will and one for Mr. Theo here. And then that should end the Q&A. So I have a question here. This is coming from Steve Christie. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate the question. This is for Will. If Solar Scriptura is false, how do you falsely how do you falsify tradition and the magisterium are also infallible without being subjective and circular since you reject a set canon in the first century. If solar scripture is false, how do I falsify tradition? Uh, he needs to be, he needs to, 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 to emphasize what, what, what kind of tradition? Very easy. If we look at a tradition and it doesn't line up with what is being taught in scripture and the, or, and he's saying first century in scripture, and then the early apostolic fathers that point to point St. Clement of Rome, such as if there is an individual going against the deity of Christ, we can teach from scripture and sacred tradition that they are wrong. So everywhere we look in early church history, there's not an era where we don't have writings. In the apostolic era, first century, we have Pope St. Clement of Rome, which modern scholars are more and more dating him to around 70 to 80 AD. So we look at what is taught in scripture and then taught by the early church. And I, of course, this is a topic for a whole other day, but I would argue that even in Clement of Rome, you have the seeds of papal primacy there. All right, uh, Theo, what are your thoughts? Um, if, I, if I gather the question, I think he's, he's talking about which, which authentic, authenticates the other. If, if Sola Scriptura is false, then how does the Catholic Church derive its authority? If it doesn't derive it from uh, Scripture, a revelation, where is it deriving it from? So I think that's kind of, if I'm gathering him right, I think that's what he's asking. So you're kind of like, well, the Catholic Church has authority because it says so, and that's the circular part. So if it, if, if the Catholic Church can't derive it from itself, it's got to derive it from something else, which would be scripture. And if, if you're deriving, if the Catholic Church is deriving its authority from scripture, you're granting sola scriptura, it may, maybe tacitly. I think that's that's how I understand the question, but I could be wrong. All right. Um, and here is a question here. It's for Theo. Uh, in Acts 15, why didn't the Council of Jerusalem or even Peter, the apostles, the apostle appeal to scripture to decide whether Gentiles, Christians had to get circumcised or not? I think they appeal to, to revelation and scripture the entire time. Uh, if you recall in Acts 15, you have uh, Peter relaying his experience. He's relaying divine revelation in real time what God has told him in real time about the Gentiles. And then you have uh, Paul and Barnabas relaying the same thing. You have God's activity, God's God um, blessing their uh, ministry to the Gentiles. Then you're appealing to Amos. They're appealing to the scriptures. It, it's nothing but uh, an appeal to revelation, either live real time revelation or the scripture itself. And, uh, and I think that, that, that whole, uh, that whole passage is, is, is one big appeal to to uh, divine revelation, aka the scriptures. All right, all right. Uh, Will, any thoughts? Yeah, I would definitely not agree. In fact, you, you don't find you don't find any particular scripture appeal to when they come to their decision. Now, the, I do agree with the brother in one thing: uh, revelation is ongoing. Obviously, uh, there's no doubt about that. So, I, I would urge my fellow Catholics to know how to use Acts 15. Uh, number one, Acts 15 shows you that Scripture alone is not the model to be utilized, despite ongoing revelation being uh, happening at the time. They don't rely on Scripture alone to, to solve this dispute that is happening. Rather, we see a model set forth, and that model uh, is the early apostolic model, and that model is still relevant today. It doesn't look anything like the way a Protestant would come to a conclusion, uh, and very clearly this is the early apostolic model, and we see that uh, Peter was the prime mover of that council, uh, as quoted by, uh, by St. Jerome. So no, they didn't hold the Scripture alone. So yeah, I think that is a good question. All right, all right. All right, guys, we'll end it at that. And I thank you guys for joining me. Uh, this is early for me, so I got a long, I got a whole day ahead of me. So uh, you guys yep. enjoy it. Enjoy the day. And uh, you got to be blessed. Uh, any closing words before I let you guys go? Um, no, nope, I'm just grateful and thankful for the debate. Thank you, William. Thank you, Marlon. Thanks, uh, thanks the audience. And uh, yeah. 
uh, I would I would simply say uh, thank you for your time, Marlon. Uh, brother, thank you for your time. Uh, had a great time. Look forward to being back with you all again. Uh, and uh, I'd be willing to debate any any Marian topic and any papacy topic in the future. Uh, would love to continue dialoguing with you, brother. And happy yeah, Halloween. Happy trick-or-treating, brother. All right, guys. Likewise. You guys. All right, guys. You guys be good and enjoy the rest of your day, man. Talk to you soon. Take care. God bless. Thank you. All right, another fantastic debate in the books. And oh, the energy level was like registered 130, 30%, I guess. Uh, it, it's, you know, what these kind of debates, as I said earlier, uh, passion is always there. And, you know, they love what they believe, man. And sometimes it can get chippy. Sometimes they can press the issue. And sometimes they can talk over each other. And you guys have been around debates long enough, theological dis discussions long enough to know that that happens. And so anyone in live chat that sort of feels sideways about it, well, you know, you might want to stop watching debates altogether because you go get some debates like this that are very spicy, if I could use the layman's term uh, for that. It can get very, very ongoing, right? So it's, uh, it's expected. And so um, uh, I hope that uh, as you guys interact with this video and uh, interact with this debate, um, I pray that you guys are picking up things, learning things that you perhaps didn't know before, and uh, that this debate will be a tool that you use in the future to study and to learn from and to gauge your arguments, to uh, produce your arguments, to see if they're even uh, able to stand, withstand uh, resistance or criticism. All right, so these are very important debates like this, and it just so happened to be on Reformation Day. Uh, as a Protestant myself, that is so important to understand. And I think if a, a Protestant, if you are uh, really wanting to dig down and understand what exactly these the solar debates are all about, the solar gratia, the sola Christus, the sola fide, sola uh, scriptura, all these solas, what are they about? Sola Deo Gloria. What are they about? Um, I think you'll be able to find them if you start reading and studying the uh the protestant movement and where all these things were developed um so i think it's extremely important that you guys do that and remember while many of you out there are celebrating the idea of halloween and things like that and you know trick-or-treating things like that i do find it extremely important that you guys understand that uh, i would say the true emphasis of october 31st which is a protestant movement right understand it know it appreciate with those Martin Luther and all the reformers, Zwingli and Calvin, all the reformers did for the church, right? And that they brought the church out of that construct, right? They, they The idea wasn't that they wanted to take away from the Catholic, they wanted to destroy or abolish the Roman Catholic church. They desired to reform it from the inside, right? It was Martin Luther's desire to reform the church. Right. It wasn't this idea of destroying or taking away the capture. They want he wanted to reform it from the inside out. Right. And so, uh, as you know, that didn't go necessarily as planned, uh, obviously. So uh, but nonetheless, I do believe that it is good history to know and to appreciate uh, whether you agree with the Protestant movement or not. I think it is a good point of church history that you should know and appreciate. Uh, if anything, you should appreciate from the, the, the perspective of those uh, those those people who spearheaded this 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 stud, this uh, this point of contention, and to deal with them and to to interact with them, um, so that's all I have to say about the Reformation, right? I think it's good to know, and that should be the primary uh, primary emphasis of celebration today. Um, you know, and you can throw some candy in the kids' bags while you're at it, right? But all that said, I'm going to get out of here. I have a long day ahead of me, and I look forward to next time. Uh, and if you have yet to do so, make sure you are subscribing to The Gospel Truth. Hit the subscribe button and that notification bell so you miss out on any, any debates, any commentaries, any interviews that are planned to go down on The Gospel Truth. You don't want to miss anything, all right? So make sure you do that. And also, before you leave, can you make sure you share this debate? Uh, uh, hit the like button, please. Hit the hit the like button. Hit the subscribe. Hit the share. Let's get it out there, right? All right. With that said, I'm out of here. May God bless you and may God keep you.